Man, I don't think I actually we can get to all the stuff. I don't think we can get to everything. And that's, that's funny. That's a good problem to have. What? Huh? I apologize for last week, gentlemen. For telling us great things about the French Laundry? Yeah, I'm confused. Or, what, what a monster. Or literally being so tired last week that I laid down during the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, folks may not know this, but we don't do this with video on, so we wouldn't have known that if you had never said anything. Well, well, I had the opportunity since I was wearing my headphones last week to, uh, to be too relaxed when doing the show. I need to be slightly uncomfortable to be more aware but i am awake and aware this week for episode 400 something 15 nice job i think that's correct because last week was a palindrome it was five yeah mm. welcome back michael's here with a cold thanks yep. for being here even though nothing through yeah muffling or snuffling all the things jj hello hello michael being a true gamer oh yeah gotta muscle through you know Oh, man. Well, uh, last week we were tired, but we did talk about food for literally the whole time, I think, almost entirely. So it's not every day uh, someone gets to experience something like that. So fully justified IMO. Uh, Yeah, you know, it's definitely a perspective shift thing that I'm still processing, to be honest. If I, you know, like, I, I don't know how... I know that it's not um, fair to lay a taco shop on the corner up against a three-star Michelin restaurant. That's not the type of food they're serving, right? Yeah. Um, but definitely the idea of like consumption of food changes a little bit, I think. Right? I mean, it should after that kind of experience. So I'm still working through that mentally, to be honest. I think the conclusion that I have come to about places like that is it is both an interactive art exhibit and a meal. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't so experience both or, or sometimes mm -hmm. even like a museum, because they'll come out and like teach you stuff in the middle of the meal also like, Oh, here's how this corn was raised or whatever. Right. And like, if you don't experience all of those parts, you know, it's it's just a different thing. So, you know, if you're just eating, well, you're just eating. That's different than, you know, having a, you know, full sensory experience. Sure, sure. But also just eating should have different values, I think. Uh, sure. We place on a lot of places. I don't know. Um, attention to detail certainly seems like an important thing. Now, I actually had a lunch. Should we talk about more food today? I'm going to do it. I'm going to talk about one food thing today. I had lunch today at a place that was suggested to me by multiple people. Uh, it was one of those hot on in on Yelp places. I actually put it up against the French Laundry, and the French Laundry has less reviews, which did not surprise me. Yeah, and that, that part makes sense, right? I mean, that's just right. volume well, of people. Been, well, it's been open 30 years, and this place has been open like three months. The new place has been open like three months. So, I mean, it still doesn't surprise me, actually. But at the same time, you know, I was hoping it'd be close. Think of the, the age bracket is, of people go in, too, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's the real one. That's true. Uh, it's rated higher than, than French Laundry. <laughs> but multiple parts of it, I was like, where's the attention to detail in this? You're asking for to make burritos for a price point that I find to be ridiculous, actually. But it's a hipster place, so we got to price them twice what they should be. I mean, I got I got to know what you consider ridiculous now. What's the most you would pay for a burrito? I, it's going to depend on the ingredients, but what I guess... What is the most you would pay for a burrito? I, I don't know, man. Like 30 bucks? Okay, well then we, let's say we're at the most you would pay for a burrito. Okay, this better be like... Filled with lobster and steak. Nope. <laughs> it wasn't. 
and okay. the, that's the thing that got me. It did have steak, but like the rice was all clumped together at the top. The steak was in the middle, and all the onions and cilantro and everything else to make it seasoned was at the bottom. Like no one even bothered to spread the ingredients when they pushed the burrito together. The tortilla was torn. It was yeah, just that, half the burrito just falling out of it. That just feels un- unacceptable. Come on, no, now. I th- it they they're popular because they offer high end ingredients. They're popular because they have a huge outdoor cooking pit, like like heritage style for their for the, all their meats that they're cooking. They're cooking a bunch of different meats. Um, but the yeah, the attention to detail for the price was crazy. And the other thing was it was a 30 minute wait to order and a 30 minute wait for food. Oof. What are you doing? Well, I mean, they're not trying to turn people over, I guess, but yeah, yeah. rough. Yeah. Um, so that's what I just am like, I'm, I'm personally reevaluating, but I don't want to talk about food forever today. You know, like we could go into whether or not a restaurant should have enough parking, but I don't know if that that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, I think the answer is these days, no, right? Yeah. And yeah. you got to deal well, with that as a person who drives. And I think, I think getting into uh, what Yelp means is also too deep for today. So instead, we should probably talk about some video games because we didn't talk about them at all. And let's, I feel like I'm back into our lane. Yeah. Well, I love other lanes, right? Like. Get, I think get the, uncomfortable once in a while. I think the digressions are great. And if people aren't here for listening to Andy talk about the French laundry for 40 minutes, like <laughs> what are you even doing with this podcast? <laughs> I'm just going to say if people don't anticipate the digressions by now. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel a little bit out of the loop actually, because uh, some, some stuff went down while I was gone and this week and a whole bunch of stuff that we need to probably catch up on. And I'm happy to do it through you, my friends, instead of through the internet. Wait, this is through the internet. I'm so confused. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo. Nintendo decided to just tell everyone every game that's coming out for every platform. Is that what's going on? Is that is that what we're doing now? I mean, we're just letting Nintendo in, do do the <laughs> summer direct. In typical Nintendo fashion, they gave us 24 hours notice that there was a not just one but two directs coming back to back this morning. Yeah, there was an indie direct and then a partner direct, they called it. And then because it's Nintendo, they added a tweet, you know, to their announcement or whatever that said, Hey, uh, we're not going to talk about the switch Two in this. Don't ask. (laughs) Yep. They should have posted that tweet at the beginning of the stream. That's what they should just do from now on. You the know, stream it, countdown. The stream countdown is just that tweet. Which part of indie and partner makes it sound like they're going to talk about the Switch Two? JJ, stop! Stop trying to apply logic to the internet. Yeah, sorry. I guess I don't know. I bet people expected Silk Song here too, and that wasn't going to happen either. So I, don't know. I, I won't. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to find out I'm right. But I guarantee you, if I went on r slash Nintendo or something like that, there's all there's definitely a post about how there wasn't direct news about the Switch Two during the direct, and how Nintendo is a dying company. I bet that that subreddit is better moderated than that, and those posts get deleted. God, I hope so. That would be my hope. But I, I think there was a bunch of stuff shown in these directs. Uh, Michael, was there anything that you noticed that stood out? Um, what stood out to me? Uh, I feel like there were a couple of things. Um, one is the DLC announcement for Sea of Stars. Yeah. Uh, the Rose of the Watchmaker. Didn't that game just come out? Uh, it just came out last year. That's just right for for this podcast. That's just near that yeah. end. I think right. Yeah, it came out. Know, um, you know, oh, it came out a year ago. To was that almost exactly a year? All right, we'll take it. Yeah. So, <laughs> wow! Happy one year birthday, Sea of Stars and Sabotage Studios. Wow! Nice. 
Um, but yeah, so they announced some DLC coming early next year. I think they just said spring. I don't think they gave a, a more exact date on it than that. Um, but it looks really fleshed out from uh, from what I saw in the trailer. It's its own new storyline, and they built a new world, and they, they made... Um, <clears throat> The main characters have a new job class each for the new area. Um, they added in a new playable character. Um, so it's it's like fully realized DLC. It's not just a, a, a little bit of, a, you know, flavor added on top. Nice. A mm, little, little bit of... Uh... Oh, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I was, I was trying to think of the word furikake, but uh, we're we're done. Seasoning is that what you were yeah, trying to well, say? But seasoning. like with a more complicated yeah. word. Well, <laughs> you know, like the yeah, sesame seeds stuff the, you'd see on top. The yeah. French laundry version of seasoning. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to just okay. We'll just move on, man. We'll just move on. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm, all I'm, say, all I'm is saying is there's there's meat there, Andy. There's more. There's more to it. It's not just garnish. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, is it, all that garnish is edible. Did they say where it picks up? Like, is uh, it post game be- or? I believe it's post game. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't. I didn't see anything specific on whether or not you have to finish the game to dive into the DLC. Hmm. Okay, I mean, it, it would make sense that you you take your party in, right? Like, they right. don't want you. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, I have to say, the stuff that stood out to me was, man, if you were a fan of JRPGs, you are feasting. Because oh, yeah? I, I was, think, I thought you were going to go with the Bellatro update. I think almost everything that wasn't Bellatro <laughs> that was announced <laughs> was an RPG. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the Bellatro one because I actually have seen it now. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, they they released a free update for everyone that uh, adds what amounts to cosmetics for the cards. Oh, okay. So there's no gameplay change. Not that I was able to detect. Mm-hmm, okay. Um, but it, if it wasn't clear from the from the trailer the cosmetics can be active at the same time oh so your cards can have witcher cards and among us cards and vampire survivor cards all in the same deck yeah and and dave the diver was the last one it it changes the face cards so like for and one for each suit so like among us is hearts the witcher is spades oh okay okay Vampire Survivors is clubs, or maybe that's spades and the other one's clubs. I don't remember. Anyway, it, but it's like that, right? Like they're all each for an individual suit, and you can turn them all on or off. Right. I think game. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for that 2025 gameplay changes to jump back into that game at all, if ever. Yeah. Uh, no, they notably, we're not is, in 2025. So. Yeah, that's, they that's did fair. say that. Um, they did say that this is the second of three. Announcements that they were going to have during summer. So, yeah, I think they said this is their like 2024, you know, roadmap surprises or whatever. Okay. And then the big stuff is coming 2025, which I suspect will be DLC. That is kind of the thing that makes sense, right? Yeah. We'll see. Balance changes, okay. whatnot. JRPGs was the thing, though. Yeah, uh, I guess um, which which way do we want to start? Because there's a few different ones. Um, there's a bunch of JRPG remakes that uh, were announced. There is a Tales of Graces F, I guess, which is a game that people liked. And they were like, oh my god, that's finally getting a remake. I'm not aware of it, but good on them. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it's one of the mainline games in the Tales series, of which there are many. Yeah, and it was one of the ones that was stuck on an older series of consoles that hadn't been brought forward, so people were happy to see it, I think. Yes. Um, But near and dear to my heart, uh, which I have talked about on this podcast before, is the Suikoden remasters uh, emerging from the shadows with no explanation or warning. 
uh, to give us a release date for those next year. I thought they were closer. I thought they were supposed to be this year. They were originally announced for early this year, I think. And then they said, like, sorry, we're delaying them. And then silence until today. Yeah, that delay was a year ago. Mm, yeah, maybe that's why I thought it would be this year. I think they were supposed to come out in like November or something last year. And then they're like, nah, we're delaying it. And then silence until now. Uh, I will say, um, people that tore those trailers apart, uh, first thing to note, uh, if you're looking for more information, apparently the Japanese version of the Direct had more uh, longer trailers for most of these games. Yeah. Uh, so not just this one, but almost all the ones we're talking about today. <laughs> so we just have bad attention spans here? Like, what's... I, I'm, but, uh... I'm making the shrugging gesture over here. I don't know, but... Uh, the sure Americans. Harder, I couldn't hear it. The Americans get the yeah fair. Yeah. <laughs> the Americans get the shortened trailers for some reason. Um, but uh, people tore those trailers apart, uh, including the Japanese ones, and found that they have changed uh, a number of things from the last time they showed it. The UI, like the battle UI, looks like pretty significantly different and updated um, for the better, which is a good thing. You know, like sometimes when they do those remasters of like old pixely games, the modern UI they put on top of them looks kind of lame. Okay. Like I think this happened to the pixel remasters at first, right? Yeah. They changed that though. Yes. And people yelled preemptively here. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it seems that they have at least gone back and added a much better looking UI. Uh, And also they changed some sound like stuff where the sound effects had been updated and sounded mm, wrong, um, sound better, at least in the stuff that was comparable so far. Uh, And then just a bunch more footage of stuff that looks really cool. So, you know, I'm a big fan of those games. Excited to see that coming uh, with a firm date now, you know, March uh, 2025. Absolutely. That's great. And then I think what will be Andy's chance to join Michael and I on the trails, you know, saga here. There's no, there's no entry Andy, point they, for me. It, there's no but way. Andy, they, they added words to the name of the game. But they just, added just words? For, just for you. I guess there's, they removed so letters. Three titles? They removed letters and added words? There's no, three so titles isn't the, on this thing. So isn't it, the Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky, wasn't that the original? FC, right? For did first the original chapter? one have FC? Did it actually have FC on it? I didn't I think it did. Think so, but may- maybe they added it later. I thought, I thought it was Trails in the Sky, and then Trails in the Sky SC, and Trails in the Sky the third. Right. Those second are correct. I guess I don't know. Well, this one is called Trails in the Sky first. <laughs> So none of those. Oh, trails in the sky first. The first. The, the, oh, we it, left out of the first. Trails, the? trails in the sky. The first. Yeah. And it's It'll a be, remake of the trails game you guys have already played. It is the remake of the first one. Why did they take off the Legend of Heroes part? Oh, they didn't. That's still there. So it's the Legend of Heroes trails in the sky. The first. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Why did they take off the word remake? Uh, it, it's implied. When you look but at how it. How will I know? They should have said it's the first remake. Or remake the Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky, the first remake. Your you eyes will immediately tell you that it's not the other game. <laughs> <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> it's Trust me, there will be no confusion. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a fully 3D game. It looks like it's following um, a lot of the stuff that was put in in Daybreak, which is the most recent one. OK, um, so the, is it probably like the Daybreak engine? They just were like, hey, uh, we could just remake all those games in this engine real fast. I maybe. by real fast. I mean, one every five or seven years. Uh, they're usually quite a bit quicker about making games than that. Um, but oh. yes, I would guess that that it is the same engine if i had to if you were going to pin me down i would guess i am i'm doing it right now you're you're pinned well that's all i got 
Um, but notably, because this is the same game as that other game, they uh-huh. don't have to retranslate it. And yeah, all that is done. The release date that was given in the trailer, you know, it said, you know, it said releasing worldwide 2025, which is, I think, a first for this studio ever. It so is. this now begs they have the not question. Done a... This this now begs the question: uh, Were all the indie game things Switch first, Switch only, not just Switch first or Switch only? Like, what am I ordering this on? Uh, you would probably want to play this on your Steam Deck because I think everything we've talked about is coming to the PC. Wow. And probably, I mean, I, I didn't look because, again, I'm not interested in playing them there, but I'm guessing all of it is coming to consoles as well. I would think so. The Obviously, the trailers and the Nintendo Direct don't show that. <laughs> Right, but sure. If you then go to the publishers, you know, YouTube or whatever and watch it at the end, their trailer has a bunch of logos at the end, you know, Steam and Xbox and PlayStation or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh fully I, 3D versus what I'm looking at here, which is what, like I, isometric. Isometri- yeah, Iso, an isometric yeah. two and a half. Yeah. I kind of like isometric. It's weird that they and went it, away from the, it. The original was great. Yeah, I mean, the original is still there, right? It's for sale. They're not taking it off of sale. Um, sure. You can still play it. Um, and my understanding is the script is the same even. So, like, they're not even changing the phrasing. <laughs> they're just like, yo, you <laughs> want to play this game in 3D? Here's the option. Well, with updated gameplay, though, because it's not like they backported the old systems here. The question is, like, what? how did they translate the new systems to the older style? Oh, okay. Yeah, good point. Because as Michael will know, the orbments and the magic system have evolved quite a bit as the games have gone on, right? They they definitely have, but uh from so, from look at the the screen captures that got posted out of after the direct, there are definitely the icons on screen as you're running around for action combat. Yeah, so a lot of people are wondering, you know, um how much this follows the action combat stuff that exists in daybreak, um, okay. you know, which, you know, as I talked about last week has a lot of, you know, you can just fight enemies and not have to go into the turn-based mode. Or is it just a lot of cases where you can like, you know, alpha strike basically to start turn-based combat. And then after that, it's, you know, more like uh, turn-based from there. Right. What is, what's the new game like? Uh, the new game has a button specifically to start turn-based combat, which you can do at whatever point. But people hmm. did not see the presence of that button on these screenshots, so it's hard to say. Neither of you have played the newest game yet, or maybe JJ, JJ has started it. JJ did play I've the started newest it, one, yeah. Right? I'm okay, like in yeah. chapter three, I think. Right. I was trying to remember if that was the second to newest or newest, but are you finding yourself using turn-based or active? Uh, you have to in some cases, right? Like it forces you, like it doesn't give you the option to do the active fighting. Okay. Mostly that's like when you're running around like a dungeon or something, you know, you can okay. fight. It, and in general, you're more rewarded for using the turn-based combat because you can stack multipliers and stuff more easily. So generally it's better to to use it. Um, but if you're fighting time. like... Total War, it's actually better for me to fight than let the computer do it. Right, exactly. And But, you know, if you're fighting, like, 15 birds or whatever, right? Like, okay, these, like, little, like, you know, or, like, you know, bats in the first dungeon, right? You're like, do I need to, like, press A to attack these bats 47 for times? The, for the, yeah, for the 30th time. Right, like... You know, you're on your way out after doing the quest. Like, do I really need to do all this? And the answer is probably no. And so then, you know, uh, the mm-hmm. action combat uh, helps you because you can just not start the turn-based combat and run past them or, you know, just jam A as fast as you can hit and kill them that way. So, you know, big deal, I think. Um, worldwide release is a big deal because that means, you know, the promise of future games not being delayed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, that's a that's a huge one. Um 
Let's see. What other stuff was in there that was good? There was a Castlevania collection. There was a there we Tetris go. collection. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, uh, still on the RPG front, right? It was the DS Castlevania games. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Dawn of Sorrow. That's one of them. Uh, Portrait of Ruin. They all, they all yep. No, 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 Order of Ecclesia. There you go. Michael got them. Oh. Yeah. Order of Ecclesia. I thought they all had to have DS in them. <laughs> Uh no, they got Donna Sorrow is the first one though, which is yes, the one why it has DS in it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that means all of the DS Vania games are now out because I think they brought Circle of the Moon out in the last collection. I believe uh, so. And is that collection available off the Switch? All all of this is on Steam. Wow. And probably also consoles. I just because Konami part of me is hat. Part of me is really, really happy that a lot of things won't be stuck on the DS forever, that they're doing a good job collecting these games and getting them out there. Yeah, I really it kind of also bumps me out a little bit that the DS will just literally turn into a rubble heap of man, the they, they actually remade the games better afterwards. <laughs> Well, but you know, they didn't do that much with these, I don't think. I think these are kind of just the games, um, you know, maybe slightly higher res or whatever, but like, you know, they didn't like... Circle of the Moon came out in the Advanced Collection, Castlevania Advanced Collection. Right, because I think that was the first one on the Game Boy Advance, or one of the ones on the Game Boy Advance, right? Yeah, well, there was Aria, Harmony, Dracula X... Yeah. So anyway, uh, so I think all the handheld Castlevanias are out now. So we got them all. Like, and I guess the the question is like, you know, well, how would the second screen stuff translate, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it seems like they did enough of moving that stuff into various menu screens um, that it's not a problem. Okay. And and I think most of those games didn't really have a. Uh, what's the word? Like it didn't force you to actively use that screen while you were doing other stuff. Nintendo first party Nintendo was the biggest user of these systems. And so I think it'll be for a lot easier for other people to move on. Like uh professor Layton series, right? And like that, that you is one of the ones you'll think of for the DS where you're like, Oh, it has to have the DS. And you think about it. It's like, no, they could just pop up a window and let you do stuff. Oh, in an over window, right? It's not like you're moving around. What? And so the really the only games that really forced you to do something on two screens exactly at the same time were like first party Nintendo games. Yeah, like these Castlevania games were like, oh, they would put the map down there or your item screen or your, Mm -hmm. you know, your souls or whatever. And that stuff is all like you can just make a menu pop up to do it. And if you look at some of the pictures, actually, it's it's docked on the right side of the screen for at least one of the games. It's an overlay, yeah. By gosh, they figured out how to do it. Hey, (laughs) problem solved. We have more compute power now. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I just think it was a, you know, for despite not having any first party Nintendo stuff, I think it was great. Speaking of more compute power, is uh, Sid Meier's going to change my life? Are they going to make me upgrade my PC? What's up? so this did actually show up in the Nintendo Direct, which is very funny. Um, because <laughs> I laughed say, at that. Yeah, I think did if you, really? you play the, if you play this game on a Nintendo Switch, I think it should be labeled a fire hazard. <laughs> <laughs> I really, it's there's no way it runs on the current Switch, right? It'll have to be on the new Switch. They say it's coming. I oh don't my think. God. I don't. I, I don't think that's a smart plan for anyone. Um, I am looking only at screenshots. And I have no other information about Civilization Seven, but it is screenshots also, look pretty good. It is also um, coming to other consoles, to be clear. So it is a simultaneous well, launch on all the no, consoles. And no PC. chance that it wasn't coming to PC. Uh, correct. Yeah, obviously, all yeah. this is coming to PC. Uh, they announced a new leader uh, and some other stuff at the Nintendo Direct, but that's not why we're here. We're going to play a game of Andy. How much do you remember about Civilization Six? And I have di- played it extensively recently. 
So, uh, so let's talk about Civilization Seven, right? Okay. They've changed yes. a lot of pretty fundamental things. Oh, uh, uh, or things that you might screens, consider fundamental. These screens still look like you're using hexagon squares. They did not do the thing I wanted them to do, which is make tanks look interesting. Or you know, like they still looks like they have the like one single unit on each square thing. Uh, it looks like maybe districts districts still look like they're a thing. I'm just looking at screenshots. This is just yeah, what, I'm, what I'm seeing. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to hold on for a minute so I can explain some stuff. Uh, first thing that was noticed uh, in the trailer is there is now verticality in the maps. Okay. So like you know, stuff on higher levels and stuff on lower levels, you know, like on the top of a waterfall versus the bottom of a waterfall. All right. Uh, whereas before that would just be like, you know, a tile or whatever. I think it's probably still going to be a tile. Uh, the higher tiles are, you know, you can't walk from lower tiles to higher tiles anymore. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, so they, did, they did add a mechanic for it. All right. So there's, you know, in, in theory, you know, which they haven't shown, but in theory, there would be like high ground bonuses or, you know, who knows what sorts of things. Right. That's good. That's that's a helpful, good thing. It just adds a lot of variation in the map, right? Without having to like do much, you just add some hills and stuff in the map. And then that makes the gameplay well, pretty different. Before the only gameplay change was like, oh, that that one takes an extra turn to move through. And it's like, OK, cool. That was cool in Civ 2. Right. And it may still work like that. Right. But it actually looks higher up as opposed to just being a flat plane with like some rough borders. <laughs> I'm know? just saying I hope that it's more what you're thinking and less the uh, we made it look better, but it's still the same. Uh, who knows? But one thing they did show. Uh, you can sail down rivers. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's huge. Well, uh, interesting, because certain things should be able to, but certain things maybe you, you would need to, like, widen the river, though. Don't know like, how it works. Can't show you. Like, I mean, they've shown, like, you know, two screenshots where it happens, but people can, are moving boats down rivers, and that's can something that's impossible. Can I put my battleship up river? That seems kind of crazy. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can't, right? Maybe they're only able to sail off the sea and deep, not. Oh, river. there is there is shallow and deep water, so maybe they maybe they've decided to implement more uses for shallow and deep water. That would be cool. Yeah, but they could classify their water as river and then say, "Oh, well, battleships can't go in the rivers." Right. Or they say they can. Who cares? Sail right. your carrier right into the middle of Paris and and shoot it. Right. Whatever. Hey, man, use rivers. It sounds awesome. Let's do it. Vikings uh, immediately salivating, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, another really big one. Um, ages. So do you remember how many ages there were in Civ Six? Um, I don't remember the number of them off the top of my head. There was like ancient, uh, bronze, classical, uh, medieval, um... I don't remember what came after that. Renaissance, uh, industrial, modern, and space? Uh, there were a bunch, I think it's safe to say. And yeah. I think the vast majority of the ones you said are correct. I think the thing that bothered me about those was that they were based on how quickly you were discovering technologies and advancing in certain points, like a point system that was a little bit of a black box, not mm -hmm. a super black box, but a little bit of like a, well, it'll end in three turns to seven turns. We're not really sure. And you're like, what do you mean you're not sure? Just yeah, by the way, uh, there are three ages in Civ seven. Oh, there well, is different. There is antiquity. There okay. is exploration. Nice. And then there, wait, no, did I get that wrong? Shoot, I might have gotten that wrong. All right, well, I've already forgotten the middle one. So I think it's antiquity, it's something, and then it's exploration. I mean, yeah, it's exploration, exploration, and the last one is modern. Okay. I think exploration Whatever. is There's the last three. one. There are three. Got yeah, it. Yeah, there are three. Um, the major defining difference in the ages 
is that you can change, uh, and in fact may be required to change your civilization between them. So I'm the Norse in antiquity. The civilizations I... available in each age are not the same. Uh, there are some civs oh. that are only available in later ages. Okay. And, you know, some only available in earlier ones. Am I limited and, on the ones that I can use based on the first one that I chose? Or how, how in-depth did they get into this system before I ask you the six million questions? They haven't said a lot, but stuff that they have said is that each Civ still has its own unique bonuses. And when you change between an age, uh, you know, you retain the previous bonuses. That would make sense, because I would be annoyed if I chose one and then all their bonuses just went away. Right. And, you know, the, their whole, like, philosophy is like, oh, well, civilizations build on each other, you know, so it doesn't, it's not really like, you know, the Egyptians the entire way through history, right? Right. So that's the thing that I would be curious about. It's like, okay, well, I picked the, like, I picked the, um, uh, the Thai civilization for, um, for antiquity. Now, can I just jump over to being the French in the industrial era? That doesn't it's, seem like it would make it, a lot of sense. It seems like the answer is probably yes. What? Um, but Civ has never enforced real world boundaries on the way you do stuff, right? So, like, that wouldn't make sense to start forcing them now. Well, it kind of does. Like, you know, if I pick Abraham Lincoln, I have to play as America. Uh, well, so that's another change that we were going to talk about, but you brought it up. So leaders no longer are related to civilizations anymore. Ooh, they took a book out of the, uh, what's the game, Michael? Uh, Seven Wonders. Yeah. I, I'm building the pyramids, but my leaders are from <laughs> are Socrates and Julius Caesar and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, so it seems like you only get one leader for the whole game. So you are not allowed to change leaders between ages. Okay, well, that would make less sense. You should change leaders more often. Uh, nope. The civs oh. change, the leaders do not. Weird. Uh, so probably that means all the leaders are available for all the ages. Uh, okay. Which would be interesting, right? Yeah. Um... You know, they showed a few different leaders, um, Napoleon, Benjamin Franklin, um, Hospitet, I want to say, is the the Egyptian one. Okay. Uh, and the Nintendo Direct showed a uh, Japanese female leader whose name I didn't catch. Sweet. Um, but yeah, that's like a huge change, right? So um, also in like the screenshots in the video, your leader's face shows up a bunch more. Mm-hmm. You know, like when you do trade and negotiations and stuff, your leader is there, like, you know, posing and, and doing stuff. Their, their, like, character model comes up a lot more often during gameplay. It's a style thing, but maybe, you know, lets you feel more about the leader than it does about which civilization you pick, I guess, since that's going to change. Yeah. Uh, they've also oh. said you can play each age as, like, a sandbox to itself, right? You can just play the Antiquity Age as a whole game. And like, you know, end at the end of that age. Well, it sounds like with the new age system that maybe they'll have more to do in the end game rather than just sort of like, I'm researching future tech. I don't know if you remember that from what was that, Civ 5 or 4? Yeah. Uh, future tech. That's my current technology. Yeah, so people are pretty interested in like how the, you know, age transition stuff is going to go. But it seems like, you know, because the sandbox is changing and because you're, you know, resetting your civilizations and stuff that it's likely to be, you know, a much more disjointed kind of experience, right? Yeah, sounds like it. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well... Uh, did you, like me, get sucked into playing a ton of Civ Six because of this? Yeah. <laughs> Who I you hope you up? took my advice and uh, gave yourself your own challenge, because otherwise it seems a little mindless these days. Civ Six has gotten too easy. Do you have all the expansions? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um... 
Yeah, I uh, I chose um, Japan, like Hojo Toki mm-hmm. Cho- Toki Mune. I want to say. Okay. Um, and the achievement for that guy is, I think you have to build seven districts in like a you know fill like one district surrounded by six other districts, basically. So this one says Meiji Restoration, playing as Japan, have a district with six adjacent unpillaged districts. Right. Um, I'm far enough now to know I have failed. <laughs> oh, no. The city, the city where I planned to do this has six districts in a ring. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not allowed to build a district in the center. The thing that's there is blocking it. I can't build a district there. Oh, no. That happened to me in a game when I was trying to build the Panama Canal plus extra canals to create, like, the seven-chain Panama Canal thing. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just like, well, I guess we've gone as far as we need to go here, and I can just quit, which is a really good feeling in Civ. When you can just be like, um, I don't know. I don't need to keep going here, right? Like I've, I've got, I've done this game to the end enough times, uh, you know, but, uh, so I don't know if you noticed, but you can search achievements now on, um, in steam. You don't have to go to like another website to do it. Yeah. Their UI is updated pretty substantially. Their UI. Yeah, for for achievements is really updated. So if you search for these things, like playing as Japan, have a district with six adjacent districts, um, you can also look up stuff where it's like, okay, what other uh, districts are there? Or what other district achievement types are there? So like, may, you may have failed at this Japanese district achievement, but also what if you built the Colosseum in that city? Because then you would have the District 12 achievement. Or mm-hmm. when you District 12 build every district type in one city and the Coliseum. Or wow. next, time you, next time you try it, completely surround your government plaza with districts or wonders you own at the start of your turn, which is Metroplex. So when you're rebuilding to try and do this again with Japan, make sure to stick your government plaza in the middle of the six adjacent unpillaged districts. Yeah, that's yeah the problem is i got blocked by like a luxury resource in the center and i don't know maybe there's a future way to like remove it what is it uh you spices or something uh, spices is yeah uh so it's one of the ones you can trade for happiness junk it spices comes from jungle tiles Maybe? I don't know. No, it's not a jungle tile. I, I okay. put a worker on it to try and like remove it, and it wasn't yeah. an option. So Well, spices got changed from being farmable to being luxury in Civ Six, so maybe you can't remove luxury. Yeah, I, I can build a plantation on it to like, you know, get yeah. the spices oh, or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. I don't I don't want it. I want it to go away. I want to put a district there. Oh <laughs> <It says> no. <laughs> well, now you know. Yeah, a lot of that type of discovery is actually kind of fun. It's a different way to play the game. And you'll find a lot of things where you're like, well, why can't I do that? Because you would never have done it f- before. Yeah, I'm but playing like, on a huge map, um, which is I don't normally do. Um, but, I, you know, it's like one of those ones with like a bunch of larger continents and then a few smaller islands. Mm-hmm. Of course, they stick Japan on the island. This map is so racist. Oh, like <laughs> racist map. <laughs> um, but it has hilariously led me to like, building a couple of cities on each continent now. Oh, okay. Uh, because like, there's no space on the Island. I gotta go somewhere. <laughs> right. I found out that like, I have to try If I want to try and get this achievement for the U S I have to play on like the biggest map possible because the national parks are randomly generated. So if you want two of these exact national parks, you'll have to, you have to like get them randomly generated on the same map. And it's like, Oh man, I don't know if I need to be chasing random achievements. Yeah, that one's probably not worth it. No. Uh, But it's been hilarious because there's a bunch of bonuses you can stack on the cards for like bonus production and stuff for your cities not on the starting continent. (laughs) 
So like, <laughs> I have a bunch of those and it's like, oh, wow, all the other cities are better than my main city. <laughs> yeah, because it's stuck with no resources. Yeah, it's like, what well, you can't expand it any further, right? It's like, it's, you know, yeah. it's like, what do I want to build on the desert tiles? Not really. You can, well, you can build those like off sea or offshore um, habitats and fisheries and put the, put the governor yeah. there. I'm yeah, only in, eight, I'm only in 1850. Split. I'm not all the way, you know, to that stuff yet. Ah, gotcha. Well, m- more power to you on your next playthrough. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I don't know how much farther I'm going to go on that one because uh, yeah. depression well, nice, is overtaking me. I mean, it's a nice way to play, right? You know ahead of time, like, oh, the thing I wanted to to do is not here, so I can just walk away from this playthrough. I have all the achievements for beating the game. It's not like I need to beat the game. Right. I think I might get, uh, there might be an achievement for winning on a huge map, which I didn't have before. There's like one achievement I could go for, but then I would have to play out all the way to the end. And as you rightfully note, the ends of these games is kind of boring. Yeah, they just, they, I mean, eventually you're building a giant death robot during your your diplomatic victory because you've run out of things to do. Yeah. And it's like, all right, like Montezuma, one more time. <laughs> you yeah. get one more and the robot yeah. is coming. I need to play the game on like a standard sized archipelago map and then... Then it can do like one, two, three, three or four achievements at the same time. Because I have, there's like a bunch of Monopoly ones, getting a bunch of resources and stuff on a standard map. But I think I played enough. I played like 100 hours recently. I probably, not 100 hours, I'm exaggerating, but probably like 20 or 30 hours recently. So I need to move on to something else. I, I got it out of my system is what I'm saying. And yeah. uh, maybe what would help me get it out of my system more is like actually stepping back into Champions of the Continent, Michael. Uh, uh, yeah, you could definitely do that. We <laughs> we had a we had a ringing endorsement. You could tavern talk. He's like, uh, well, no. we talk today. And it was maybe those going into it and. I think a lot of people were waiting to see if um, <clears throat> the other shoe would drop in terms of us getting more news about an update that uh, that was so disappointing after the last Tavern Talk, uh, I guess two Tavern Talks ago now. And there was no mention of any further updates. Um, it was just sort of a business as usual Tavern Talk. I think changes uh, take time, so... I, and I they brought too. a bunch of characters. They brought a bunch of characters that um, JJ, you were saying, aren't aren't supposed to be out yet. So the majority of, and, and I think at this point, all the characters they've released now since, like Nivelle and these ones that are now coming, all released in Japan with their, like with Celestia had already been out. And so they all had the torch point system, which we don't and, have. And- and they're six. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So they so they had six star boards and they had torch point abilities, all of which you know we don't have. And so people were wondering, like, are they going to release these guys without that? When some of them kind of needed them in order to make their kit work. <laughs> Answer: Yes. Which yeah. is crazy because that means they got to patch those things back in, or they just add the ones that were there in, and the characters just get a little better instead of a lot better. Yeah, well, right, interesting. Right, the two the two cats that we're getting are both buffed. Both so cats. Five, their five star cat kits have been buffed. Strong which cats. Means they'll then introduce those crucial skills on top of the the buffed characters. So, kind of hard to gauge how how, how good they'll be done. Yeah, I think the number one thing I came away with, you know, from hearing about it and reading about it afterwards was like, people were like, well, they did buff them a lot. Yeah, but it's like, one of them is like magic. So it's like really focused on magic skills. And it's like, well, magic kind of sucks. It's it's the same problem as before where it's like, they buffed them. That's great. We still know what's coming, and also they were bottom tier before. So unless somehow 
you're going to change the entire way the game is played. Like, remember when Joshua came out and everyone was like, you guys, they buffed him and he's insane. We should all have pulled Joshua. We made a mistake, blah, 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 blah. And then that just died. No one cared anymore. And now we have people that are better than even the buffed Joshua. So, like, uh, yeah, maybe the 50% cap one will change the way the game is played. I, I think that the difference here, you know, compared with Joshua, right? Some of the buffs that they've gotten recently, like some of the other characters, have turned them into like actually really good units. Like I'm thinking of like Nefty or mm-hmm. uh, Roland. Uh, yeah, Roland, right? Um, like just very powerful units that because of the buffs, right, wouldn't have existed in JP and then opened new strategies in the server we're on that wouldn't have been available right and thus the meta shifts a little bit if you have those units but if you don't then the other ones are still there right right yeah plus so, how oh go ahead no go ahead i was gonna make a different joke so go ahead and keep going because mine was gonna take us off topic you know so like what is the ch- you know so what are the chances that these buffs were significant enough to make these characters like actually really good or to enable some new strategy that we didn't have before. I don't know. The one that's like purely magic focused, I think is going to be really tough. Although, you know, maybe if you have, um, what's the, the other magic one that came out recently with the two colors, Detrina. Yeah. If you have her, you know, she has a bunch of like magic powering abilities, maybe them two together can make a magic thing. Good. And like Frederica, because she's pretty powerful with magic and so on, I guess. I don't know. But like, or you could just use warriors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. or you can just follow the, the model that's already working in Japan, right? Yeah. So then, you know, the question is the other one, the merchant one, has a bunch of physical buffs. And obviously, you know, we're being in a physical meta generally right now. Is yeah, I mean, it goes from sword to bow, right? Sword to bow is like the meta for the next two years. Well, sword to dagger yeah. and then and then into sword bow. Sword to dagger to bow. Oh, there you go. And so the question is like, well, then are those buffs worth it? And it seems like people are kind of falling on, well, like kind of, but maybe not. Like, I guess I don't know where exactly the plan. Like, it, it still seems unclear to me whether they're like really good or it's just like, eh? Hmm. Huh. Like the yeah, problem initial, with the, mer- the mer- oh god. I was going to say initial initial reading makes it seem like um, maybe still not worth it and Isla is hard to gauge only because she does a lot of supporting roles and the characters that you would want to have magic team DPS for her either haven't been buffed yet or aren't out yet. And so it's really hard to tell how those buffs are going to play out in Ian when the team that you would want her to build around doesn't really exist yet. Him to build around. Yeah. And the, the only, I think the only reason people really aren't, you know, hype on Rick is that his abilities require him to be in the front row and buff the front row. Which means that he's wasting space. Yes. Yep. Now his buffs are good. Like they're strong and they would add, you know, damage to your other people there. But there are other characters who can do that stuff and then also sit in the back row and <laughs> that's... or be in the front and buffing and doing good damage. Right, exactly. You know, oh, do you want to use Erica's buff that hits everyone or do you want to use can just this attack. guy? Right? Yeah, exactly. Or do you want to use this guy, right? And it's like mm-hmm. No, Cezantos' buff or this guy. And it's like, obviously, you pick the ones that can also then do damage later. So, you know, I I, I think we'll have to kind of wait and see a little bit. Um, but hey, they're cute looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, how many we, are all, we are all Molu. Yeah. How many people pulling cats just to pull cats, you know? Uh, there will be a significant number, I assume. All right. Well, if you're pulling cats, where could you email us? JJ. 
uh, we're at podcast at we were gamers.com. That's podcast at we were gamers.com. An email address. I know emails are old, but hey, we're old too. So, yeah. You know, you know what? It's more personal, it's not social media. And it gives us an opportunity for our new segment at the end teasers for next week. We're talking TV because oh. we, we finished Shogun over here. Oh, oh, there we go. And we're going to talk about some food, more food, and maybe a little keyboard situation. We're not, not let the keyboards go, you know? Okay. Yeah. Positive keyboard developments. Real quick before we go, though, I have to get your guys' take. What do we feel about Gator wine? <laughs> I'm not stick it in with the Haterade. Haterade. <laughs> oh. It's terrible. It's food for the gram, which is uh, now going to be my new thing. It's going to be like it's food for the Yelp. You know, is, is Yelp but, more popular? Than I think it is. I've always thought it is kind of like, yeah, it's a restaurant thing, but kind of like whatever. Is they it really were, popular, actually? They've been sued multiple times for uh, for monopolizing people's uh, traffic, of you know, that kind of thing. You know, if you if a lot of had a lot of restaurant people tell me if we don't have a Yelp page and a Yelp sticker and the, all this stuff in the windows, people don't come. Hmm. I guess it's one of the primary ways people find restaurants, unfortunately. I mean, uh, we'll get into it next week. We'll talk about Yelp next week, too. All right. I did, uh, well, Andy, I did have one, uh, I had one 60 second news thing for you that was uh, game related, but non Nintendo Direct. So I'm going to hit you with some words real fast. You can, you can react as you will. Okay. Mind I don't me. have the right colors for the Gator wine. I, I have blue and I have No, green. you're good. <laughs> Monument Blue Valley, the right one. Monument Valley, I like Monument the Valley three. This. Ooh, snap in a hat. December tenth, twenty twenty four. Monument That's Valley this three. This year is it? Uh, is it Netflix still mobile? Is it iPhone exclusive. <laughs> Put the brakes on that one. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. go. Uh, it's fine. I have a Netflix account, so I guess that means I get Netflix games. Yeah, it'll it will eventually. Apparently, they already said becoming mobile for Android and iPhone, but as yeah, so release, it will be. Ne- uh, so Netflix games are mobile, though. I have no huh. idea. Okay, how about this? Uh, I will figure it out, and we'll play. We'll figure it out together right away. All right. Okay. Tune in next week. We'll, we'll, no, I mean, we'll, we'll whenever. <laughs> not next oh, week. Oh, oh, you mean. Not giving Netflix extra it, time it, to it, make. <laughs> they, didn't pay, they didn't pay me to talk about their game. <laughs> Hold on. The Monument Valley people might deserve us to talk about their game, though, because us, us two uh, makes good games. I do think the way Michael laid that out was perfect, though, because it's like that uh, that meme where it's, you know, it's like, you know, Monument Valley three, and you're like eyes widening. <laughs> like the next one, it's like December this year, and you're like, oh, oh, and then it's like Netflix exclusive. It's like closing the door, leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm still standing at the door. He's the one that slammed it in my face. <laughs> Why is this business decision getting in the way of my fun? I so that's the thing. I think. Ah. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Who cares? I'm. Who cares? We'll figure it out. It's made by us too. I just looked it up, which means it's gonna be good. It doesn't matter who's distributing it. I'll figure out how to play it. <laughs> <laughs>